Shits and giggles, hang on. Quit it, Chase. I looked away. I know. If you do yeah. something, it's going to make me go. Hang All on a second. Right. Are you ready? Here we go. I'm Scott Rouse, I'm a body language expert and analyst, and I train law enforcement in the military in interrogation and body language. And I created the number one online body language course, bodylanguagetactics.com, with Greg Hartley. Mark? I'm Mark Bowden. I'm an expert in human behavior and body language. I help people all over the world to stand out, win trust, and gain credibility every time they communicate, including some of the leaders of the G7. Chase. Hey, I'm Chase Hughes. I did 20 years in the U.S. military, wrote the number one best-selling book on human behavior, profiling, influence, and persuasion. And I train people in those things today. Greg? Greg Hartley. I'm a former Army interrogator, interrogation instructor, resistance to interrogation instructor. I've written 10 books on body language and behavior. Put together this number one bodylanguagetactics.com course with Scott Rouse. And I spend most of my time on Wall Street and corporate America. All right. Not long ago, we interviewed Don Wells uh, about his, his daughter, Summer, who's missing. And we got to go to King. Greg and I went to Kingsport. We all four couldn't go. And the only two that, that could go were Greg and I. So we had a little meeting and we got all of our questions together and decided how we'd approach this. So what you're going to be seeing as we interview him, is, as, as you saw, if you've watched the interview with him, like Greg always says, it's just the tip of the spear. That's all we were. But we were, we were representing all four of us. So that, that's real important to know. And as we go through these, we're not going to go through every section of the interview, just the parts that we think are important that people are going to look at and go, oh, this means this and oh, that means that when we'll find out if those actually do mean that or not. Greg, you want to add anything to this? Yeah. So a couple of things. We met this guy in a hotel. This is not an interrogation room. We don't have badges. We don't have handcuffs. We don't have any of that kind of control. Number one, we want to mention that. Number two, the guy came there willingly and stayed as long as we talked to him and finally left. I will tell you that at least 33% of people will be disappointed with our conclusion, no matter what we come up with during this. This is a very serious case. We cannot say the name Summer Wells is missing enough times. She's still missing. We don't know what happened to her, and we really need everyone to pay attention to that. We'll flash up her information. As we went through this, we had our own ideas, and we have to overcome those. Any bias you have in your head, you have to come up with that. The other thing is to remember, like I always say, if you're interrogating someone, you have absolute control. You can do a lot of things you can't do when you're sitting face to face with someone. And to Scott's point, if you start pounding the desk and saying, you know, where is this person? Well, guess what? This will be a really short interview. So a little bit different questioning technique, a little bit different style. And you'll also realize the guy when he first came in said to us, look, I don't talk really well. So he wanted to be comfortable and we want to make sure he's comfortable and he was more than willing to participate. And we appreciate that from this family trying. Our intent is to get as much information out about Summer Wells as we possibly can. So you hear us use her name at every turn. That's it. Yeah, sometimes you'll see us laughing along with Don. We're trying to, we're at, the, at the beginning of that, we're creating a rapport, getting him to like us and want to tell us stuff so he feels safe. And some of these videos is going to look a little bit nervous, especially at the beginning as we get the baseline videos. Because at that point, he hasn't really connected with us yet. He can't tell. He's been stung a couple of times, people coming out and doing it with, with an agenda that he wasn't aware of when they were videoing and that it came out later and didn't look too good for him. But so as we go through this, remember that's that's the way this looks. Also, let me add that that day Don had uh, his ears were stopped up and they really were because sometimes we'll ask him a question. He'll say, what? And, you know, like and people go, oh, he was this is where he's busted. He couldn't hear. We uh, we talked to him out in the parking lot before that for, you know, five, 10 minutes. And he was, huh? huh? Everything because he couldn't yes. hear well. And he kept saying, listen, my ears are clogged up. So when you see that, um, it's not him being shocked by the question he just didn't hear it he couldn't hear him we know the difference in those two the way those look so just so you know and yep. he prefaced it with that and we went in knowing that so all right you guys ready let's yep. go here we go well, how, so long, how long is the the, the the saturday school last for the kids uh, we'll be there at 9 30. well they have we got our first class it runs about an hour hour and a half and then we go to the big uh 
to the big room together. And the kids are, are separated from everybody? Yeah, at the first class. And then we all join together in the big room. And so, have the, so they have teacher different, I guess you got different teachers. Yeah, with like Robin uh, and other ones that teach the younger ones. And there's a lot of kids there that are extremely happy. Yeah. How, uh, many, how many classes are there, do you think? Well, you got your younger kids and then you got your... You know, uh, I'd say there are about three or four different classes and are age there, groups. Are all the uh, so all the all the girls and boys that are at summer's age are in the same right. class? Yes. Who teaches that class? Do they have a uh, I can't remember her name. Uh, I know Robin. I think maybe Robin teaches the youngest ones. Yeah. And so then, she was her teacher. Yeah, I think so. Yeah, and that's why she was so proud, you know, to give Robin that little yellow necklace yeah. and the yeah. bracelet. All right, Mark, why don't you go first? Yeah, so I'm going to talk here about what I think he's very good at, because if you if you look across the interview on a whole, you're going to go, oh, he seems to not know some details, but he knows the details he knows, and he doesn't know the details that he doesn't know. And what he does seem to know pretty well is is spatially like he can tell distance and he knows if something's you know the big room maybe can't name the room but it's it's the big room so uh not good at knowing the names of kind of or, or the classes that people will be in so you get a little micro shoulder shrug on that even when he mentions you know the buckets that people are put in the partitions that they're put in he's not quite sure so as a as a baseline we've kind of got to go there's stuff that he's gonna know and we'll get downward intonation and we'll get a lot of certainty and there's stuff that he just won't know and some of the stuff he won't know you and i might go well why don't you know that like how come you don't know how old your kids are well just just so you know it takes me ages to work out how old my kids are okay and i love my kids and i've spent my whole life with my kids okay i would consider myself a pretty good father and if you go how old are your kids i go oh because i have dyslexia and numbers are really hard now i i don't know uh what medications uh don is on i don't know what um learning difficulties he may or may not have that would take a different type of interview but i have to put into this that it's he's he won't necessarily not know things because he's covering stuff up he's just going to not know stuff because that's not the stuff that he knows now what he does come with is the idea of being uh proud okay so an emotional idea and he and he illustrates that clearly demonstrates demonstrates the pride there of the the yellow necklace uh, the bracelet oh and and they're extremely happy again happiness pride so he's able to access the idea of other people having emotions that that can be quite important and he knows the stuff that he knows i'm gonna leave it at that chase what do you got for us yeah i agree with you on this baseline development here what uh, we're starting to see that it's common, even in the other videos and the rest of this video, that Don starts to answer a question before Scott or Greg was finished asking a question, just because he's got the gist of it. He says, oh, I understand what this question is. I'm just going to go ahead and start answering. So that's a baseline behavior for him. And there's a lot of illustrations and body narrations here. He's talking about the necklace, the, this uh, bracelet. And we're starting now to see this tendency with his eyes, more specifically his blinking. And when Don is processing data, when he's trying harder to come up with something or to remember the specific details while he's talking, his blink rate is very quick. So there's an eye flutter there. So the more confident he is with the information, the less often he blinks. So we see one thing when he's really confident about something that he's talking about, there's a marked lowering in how often Don blinks in here. So those are the two things uh, I'd like to just point out uh, in the baseline. Uh, Scott? All right. As, as I'm asking these questions, I'm, I've got my arms open like this, and my questions are going, and then I'll stop them halfway through the question and hoping he'll pick up on what I'm saying, and then I'll move to further into that question. So it keeps him on his toes to be paying attention. So, he, so it feels like, even though he's been asked these questions before, he, if he has been, then he'll be trying to take in that information to make sure it's the first, that this is the first time he's been asked that question before. 
we are seeing those things where he's unsure. Uh, both of you guys nailed that. And he's not sure because he doesn't know. He hasn't, he hasn't been depth, in depth thought about those things. So he's just relaying information. Not, he's not comfortable with this yet. He's really not, he's really not in with us yet. So he's, he's, he's a little stand, not standoffish, but he's a little bit, um, he's holding back just a, a touch. But at the same time, the innocence and the, the eyes up and all that, this isn't, I mean, Don's a great guy, but he's nothing, he's not, the most innocent guy in the whole wide world. So it's in that position, having a camera camera on you, being accused of something like this. A lot of people have accused him of it. Nobody in law enforcement has. Um, that's going to make him act that way as well. So he's going to be a little bit standoffish and worrying about how he looks to us, especially since he knows who we are and what we do. And that's the reason we're there specifically to do that. So, but I think he's holding up pretty good uh, so far in this part. And you're right, Mark. We see a couple of things that let us know he's not sure. And it's not deception. I'm not seeing any deception in here whatsoever when it comes to these answers. I'm just seeing him be unsure. Greg, what do you got? Yeah, so let's walk down the same path. We start off looking at a factual presentation. We ask the right questions to get him to give us facts, just facts. There's no reason for him to tell us anything stupid. So we're looking for information about how he processes information. Mark, love the fact you picked up on the pride. He's talking about this jewelry. His chin rises even to show pride. That's what we typically associate with pride. When he's accessing and chasing with you, the blink rate is an indicator of processing. And he only answers questions that he's picked up on. If he doesn't truly understand the question, we'll see him stop, condition the question, maybe ask my house. We'll see it more than one time in here. But when he does understand the question, he just spits out facts and he gives you what he's got. Now, sometimes his understanding of the question may be tainted and some of that. And Scott, I would also say this. You see us behaving differently there than you see us behaving here. I told you I got all these wrinkles on my forehead from using my forehead, and I don't do it a lot here except for to show you what things look like. But when I'm talking to someone, I'm constantly twisting my forehead and looking at them, and you'll be able to pick our body language up as well going through this. This is a good opportunity for us to see what's normal for him with little stress, and Scott's dead on when he came into the place. He was stressed. He knows what we do, and he came in to talk to us. I'll leave it at that. All right. How long, so how long does the, 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 the Saturday school last for the kids? Uh, we'll be there at 9.30. Well, they have, we got our first class. And it runs about an hour, hour and a half, and then we go to the big, uh, to the big room together. And the kids are, are separated from everybody? Yeah, at the first class, and then we all join together in the big room. And so, have who, the, so they have teacher different, I guess you got different teachers. Yeah, like stuff. Robin uh, and other ones that teach the younger ones, and there's a lot of kids there that are extremely happy. Yeah. How many uh, how many classes are there, do you think? Well, you got your younger kids, and then you got your, you know, uh, I'd say there's about three or four different classes and are age there, groups. Are all the, so all the, all the girls and boys that are at summer's age are in the same right. class? Yes. Who teaches that class? Do they have a uh, I can't remember her name. Uh, I know Robin, I think maybe Robin teaches the youngest ones. Yeah, and so then, she was her teacher. Yeah, I think so, yeah. And that's why she was so proud, you know, to give Robin that little yellow necklace yeah. and the yeah. bracelet. Let's move forward then. And did he never, did he ever t teach him or anything? Did he ever do a? Uh, David? Yeah. Uh, our pastor? Yeah, yeah. no, he's talking about, okay. about David. Okay, you got David Dawson, then you got David, uh, David, our pastor. David, um, the pastor, yeah. The pastor. Yeah. Um, he teaches the adults, like I would go to his class yeah. and, and my wife, you know, the older ones, and he's got an awesome class. Uh, love it. Absolutely yeah. love no, it. But never, never kid, never, you never work with the youth group or anything? Um, not not the pastor. Um, I don't know what he teaches in their school. No, you know, I'm right. not familiar with that too much. I've been there, but I don't yeah. know. Yeah. yeah. All right, Greg, what do you got? Yeah, here if we watch him, he uses illustrators, I would go. He walks through and he's he's focused on what you're asking, but he's also trying to give you information. He's talking to Scott, trying to give him information. You'll notice that brow rise and him look at him and then look at me to see that we're perceiving. There's nothing to hide, but this is his request for approval, his chance to look and see if we are agreeing with what he's saying or understanding what he's saying. There's no reason to agree. We just need to understand. His blink rate again, you see the processor speed come in, as you would call it, Chase, as he gets to something where he needs to think his processor speed starts to go in to overdrive, and then he nods for affirmation to see if you're getting it. A lot of eye contact with both me and Scott, looking to make sure that we're understanding what he's saying. Not yet understanding why we're asking this. If you ask him, I guarantee you he wouldn't have said, they're trying to get a baseline. He would have said, they're digging for something 
And when you ask a person a question, they first internalize that question, understand what it means before they try to answer it. And we're seeing that. Uh, Chase, what do you got? Yeah, I agree with you. These are, these are the baseline questions. So we're seeing a little bit more of the blinking as they're just kind of getting close to any of these parts of the story that require some processing speed. And what Greg and Scott are doing here is very common in interview and interrogation. I think it should be way more common in employment screenings when somebody's going up for a job. But yeah. this baseline is a, a critical part of a conversation where I'm understanding how does this human being behave when they're not under stress they're not being accused and they're answering things that are truthful and that I can prove to be true, which is, and we're looking for that, that behavior. So just to, just to, as an aside to this, if you were an interrogator or a, a job interviewer, you're in the business of talking to people and detecting deception, change is more important than understanding, like, here's what crossed arms mean. Here's what genital covering means. Looking for changes and deviations in that person's behavior is a big deal. Somebody says scratching your nose is a lie uh, or deceptive behavior. If someone scratches their nose all the time, the time they're probably being deceptive is when they stop. So we're looking for changes more than just these singular behaviors. And that's and a great definition of baseline Chase just gave you. That's it. That's yeah. It. And so and this is kind of Greg and Scott continuing to probe a little bit. And for most people, it would just sound like, okay, they're just asking this ancillary information to start building an idea, a story, a narrative, and an understanding of, of this environment. And we're seeing Don still on baseline. He's comfortable illustrating. So keep that in mind as we're going forward. He's comfortable illustrating with his hands. He's showing things. He's pointing and he's using his body to show the story. Mark? Yeah. So often if I'll interview people, I will try and get them to be emotional, try and get them to use emotional words, eventually try and get them to self-reflect, talk about themselves and see how they manage that. What's really interesting about this is he's going again by himself into emotional areas. I love it. It's awesome. Talking about the the, the class. Now you might say, and, and you'd have every right to say this, well, maybe he's putting that on. Maybe he's trying to put up a front. Maybe he wants to project this mask to us of being involved in, in the the church. I don't get that from the way he says it. It's quite understated. Uh, it has downward inflection to it. He doesn't look for approval on that. It has a lot of earmarks for me that suggest he's being honest about he does love it. It is awesome. And, and that's something we might expect with somebody who is trying to find a new community. If you're going to buy into that narrative that he puts forward. And I'm not saying you should. If anything, I'm trying to give you some other ideas to go with here because you already have your biases and that's okay. But what if I'm right? I mean, you could say, hey, Mark, you don't know anything. You're not right at all. That's that's okay. You can do that. But what if I'm right? Because if you're wrong early on, if your ship is a degree off of meaning at the start of your journey, you're so far off as you've gone down this narrative. So what I would suggest is as we go through this, just close up your ideas a little bit, make them a little more lean, a little less extreme right at the start, and you might be able to hit the target at the end rather than the being way, way off. So I'm going to say when he says, I love it, it's awesome, that he's being honest uh, about that. You could prove me wrong in the end, but I'm going to go with he's being genuine about that. Uh, Scott, what do you got for us? All right. One of the most important things we wanted to get to was finding out when he was explaining something, if he was doing it for the first time, if he was if he was making something up. So the part about the confusion between the uh, that we discussed there was trying to have him spend that was I'm, I'm I don't know what's going on. Were you talking about this guy or this guy? Because we knew there were two that with the same name. So we as we went in, we wanted to make sure that we got that um, his exclamation explanation of, of things. So when we were confused how he would look when he was explaining things to us. Um, and, but then again, he was still open. We get this was taken. This was filmed a little bit after I believe it was after he cried a little bit, wasn't it, Greg? Yes. Yep. 
That's yep. why his eyes are watery like that. So, and he was, he's coming down from, from, from an emotional or trying to come back up from an emotional down at this point. But so we got a good uh, handle on his baseline for explaining something he thinks we're confused about. So if we don't understand something, he's explaining for the first time as he was there. And that ex explanation will know if we get in, if it were to get sticky and we'd start talking about uh, some other specifics that we need to know about, is he being, as he said this before, is he making it up? That's where that's uh, was it, that was the reasoning behind that. So you guys covered everything else. All right. Hey, one, uh, one thing to point out, Scott, I think it's important because this is a long video. We're not going to cover every interaction we right. had with him. A couple of things to point out. Number one, Don does have a checkered past. I mean, I'm not going to try to defend this guy for whatever has gone on in his past. But every one of those things, no matter what you say, may or may not be true. We don't know all the details. That still doesn't mean that he did this. That's the reason we went to find out what he knew about Summer Wells, not to figure out what his past was. We were digging for something specific. And so as you're watching this, and when you, I don't think we're going to cover him crying today. I pushed him to an emotional state intentionally to see him cry. I asked him one time, how do I get to your house? A very open-ended question. And you could see the confusion in his face about what are you asking? We did that intentionally because we're trying to get, what does he do when he's embarrassed? What does he do when he's you know, when he is confused, what is it? And then when you start digging into questions, that body language should come back. So we'll talk about it as it comes up. And did he never, did he ever t teach him or anything? Did he ever do a... Oh, uh, David? Yeah. Uh, or pastor? Yeah, yeah. no, he's talking about, you're talking okay, about David. Okay, you got David Dawson, then you got David, um, David, our pastor. David, the pastor, yeah. The pastor. Yeah. Um, he teach the adults, like I would go to his class yeah. and, and my wife, you know, the older ones, and he's got an awesome class. Uh, Love it, absolutely yeah. love but it. But never, never kid. Never, you never work with the youth group or anything. Um, not, not the pastor. Um, I don't know what he teaches in their school. No, you yeah, know, right. I'm not familiar with that too much. I've been there, but I don't yeah. know. Yeah. Are we good? Yeah. Yes. All right. And he starts, you know, uh, coming up with excuses why he can't make it to work and stuff, and uh, and, and giving me trouble. And then the day I fired him, he was, uh, you know, doing a pan like that there, okay? Mm -hmm. And uh, he spent probably two hours on it. Well, it just sort of took 20 minutes to coat that with mud, first coat. And we were supposed to do something else, and he just jumped on that, and he was speaking under his breath and just carrying on. And then he comes to me with a pan of mud, and he says, there's all kind of trash in there. Get it out of there and give me some different mud. So I was like, my world, okay. I threw it away and got him some fresh mud and he come back at me again. He's like screaming at me, you know, I told you, that, did you put it back in there or what? And, and You're I, familiar with that kind of behavior for somebody yeah, like oh, that. Yeah. It seemed like that was kind well, of Well, I looked on YouTube of, of all the, the behavior that uh, somebody on meth would have. Mm -hmm. You know, the only thing I can remember, only one I can remember is hyperactive. Sure. But, uh, yeah. But, yeah uh, but he was screaming at me, you know, just go home. I'll take care of this job. I got this job. I'll handle it by myself or whatever. And I thought about that, and I went to lunch. And I come back, and I told him to leave. Get off the job. Don't want to work with you one more second. And he didn't like that too well. All right, uh, Chase, what do you got? So right here, he, he goes to about noon or 1 o'clock, if we're looking at him with his eyes while he's talking about watching this YouTube video. This is a very vital data point for any interrogator. Not that I'm relying on some chart from 1970 of where the eyes move and what it means. I'm relying on what I just observed. Uh, he was recalling looking at something and that's where his eyes go. I'm gonna make a note of that. And then if I'm asking him to describe something visual or something where he has to recall visual data in the future, and I see somewhere different and I see him and it could be a guilt question that he looks a different direction. That is a huge red flag for me. Uh, there's equal eye contact to both Greg and Scott during his entire answers. There's a wonderful uh, establishment of some, some form of baseline here. And he demonstrates a lot of comfort with his body illustration. He's showing stuff with his body. He's showing this thing. Uh, this drywall pan and pointing it up in the in the room that you guys were in. He's showing the bucket with the mud in it and talking about when he threw it away. And he shakes his head while he's speaking about things that he's disagreeing about. So he's saying, 
this guy was speaking under his breath and carrying on and he's shaking his head during that. And then he's nodding while speaking about something that uh, he took a stand against this guy, which is a wonderful piece of baseline. He's nodding during positive things. And when he wants you to agree, he's shaking his head during things where he's disagreeing or in some kind of disagreement with what he's speaking about. I'll leave it at that. Greg? Yeah, it, this guy's telling a story and he's illustrating. This is, I'm going to guess if you're his friend and you're hanging out with him, well, we know that if we've talked to him twice and we know that this guy has a storytelling kind of a personality, he's using references, that pan right there. He's giving you a reference. He's telling a story using his hands. He's illustrating these things that punctuate your words or thoughts. He's moving his hands to make points. He's making things bigger or smaller. He's using a lot of words that we don't hear him use in other cases. He does some downright eye accessing when he's talking about the guy. Chase is talking about up left as he's speaking about something he visually remembers. And then he does some downright, which we typically associate with emotion. So as he's thinking as he's telling the story and he's giving out information. The cadence of his speech is a little more lilting as he's telling the story and telling you something and giving you a frame of reference for one of these guys. I told Scott it's a little bit like ghost stories when he's telling you all these different people he thinks may have done something because he's trying to give you his thoughts and illustrate it with enough words to make it fit. Now, when we start to ask him stories about a question that we are sorry we start to ask him questions about the story candace's story if he doesn't have that same level of detail it's going to automatically make people jump to red flags if it's secondhand story it'll be a different way of telling but this is him telling something that happened to him and i believe it happened to him it's easy to follow his baseline scott what do you got yes he was fairly comfortable talking about this his illustrators were open he was very fluid with his he was loping as he as he talked and loping is when you just kind of go right along and everything sounds just fine sounds the way it should no uh no deception in here anywhere no need to be any for any deception in here everything looked the way it should look everything sounded the way it should sound and we weren't getting any 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 pushback from him on this kind of thing obviously for this we wouldn't but he was, as he went into details of stuff, again, great for baseline as he starts telling about things he's experienced and is giving us that information. Because I don't think he's told anybody for the first time the things he found on the internet about uh, uh, drug use. You know, I don't, I don't think it's, it, it would, that would be new to him. So that was the only the only part where I'm, I, I know I did, and I'm pretty sure Greg did too, or like, you're telling us about that. <laughs> and where he may have in his past have experienced those things. I don't know how to word it differently. I can be completely wrong. Don't know. But that's the only one I made sure to pay attention to, attention to so I could know if that came up again, a situation, uh, I would recognize those those cues as we went through. All right, Mark, what do you got? Yeah, so absolutely right. Couldn't agree more. He's creating a, a story here. You've got all the elements of the story. He does it really well. He describes it spatially. He takes on the characters. He does the voices. He does the emotions. So a great baseline as to what he'll do if he's really engaged with a story and he wants to engage you. I think he does the YouTube piece about the meth head because he wants to cast that character as the meth head. And so he goes, look, you know, authority of YouTube, data point of one, that'll be our meth head in the story. So so I think that's what, he, what he's kind of, you know, doing there. I think what this says uh, to me is, is so he says, um, he, there's an upward inflection right at the start here. Uh, I think he wants us to approve of how he handles this situation. And then he describes the situation. And this is really Don's, in my mind, soap opera world, because he quickly gets into this drama that is probably interesting if you're part of it. And if you're outside of that, you might well go, what's this got to do with with anything that's going on here. But it is easy to get dragged in, isn't it? It's easy to get dragged in and go, okay, there's a meth head involved, is there? Bit of violence going on. And he's pretty good at doing, you know, that, that, that it was getting quite aggressive because uh, he rubs his nose there. I think that's because he's actually getting heated himself. You'll often see people do that when they're getting aggressive because blood will rush to the nose. Uh, so I think he's he easily draws us probably unconsciously into this soap opera world that he's got of, of drama going on. And to an extent, we need to resist that a little bit because again, we might end up getting dragged down exactly the wrong narrative here. And we've got to keep open to where the real facts might be or the real information might be as to, well, what, what's happening with summer? Uh, there, that's all I got for you.
Okay. And he starts, you know, uh, coming up with excuses why he can't make it to work and stuff, and, uh, and and giving me trouble. And then the day I fired him, he was, uh, you know, doing a pan like that there. Okay. Mm -hmm. And uh, he spent probably two hours on it. Well, it should have took 20 minutes to coat that with mud, first coat. And we were supposed to do something else, and he just jumped on that, and he was speaking under his breath and just carrying on. And then he comes to me with a pan of mud, and he says, there's all kind of trash in there. Get it out of there and give me some different mud. So I was like, my world, okay. I threw it away and got him some fresh mud, and he come back at me again. He's like screaming at me. You know, I told you, that, did you put it back in there or what? And, and You're familiar with that kind of behavior for somebody yeah, like that. Yeah. It seemed like... Kind of well, I looked on YouTube of, of all the, the behavior that uh, somebody on meth would have. Mm -hmm. You know, the only thing I can rem only one I can remember is hyperactive. Sure. But uh, yeah, but, yeah uh, but he was screaming at me. You know, just go home. I'll take care of this job. I got this job. I'll handle it by myself or whatever. And I thought about that, and I went to lunch. And I come back, and I told him to leave, mm -hmm. get off the job. Don't want to work with you one more second. And he didn't like that too well. All right. The incident with Summer happened when Summer disappeared. Where were you working that day? Um, let's see, I was at, uh, I was in Jonesboro. Okay. Okay. Yeah. Jonesboro, which? Yeah, Jonesboro. Um, uh, Tennessee? Yeah. Okay, because I, I, yeah. I don't know this area very well. Yeah. How Jones far away is that from home? Well, it takes 45 minutes to get from there to my house. Okay. And uh, so up 81 all the way, and uh, that's where I was working. All right, uh, Chase, what do you got? So I think uh, there's loping that's ever present through a lot of these things. Greg right here is probing for some more baseline and making a couple admissions that, you know, I'm not from here, I don't know the area very well, which helps the other person to open up more. And this actually works. And his baseline is usually different when he's uh, asking someone different types of questions. So we're going to see his eyes move different ways. Uh, we're going to see him react different ways to something called episodic memory of events and things that he recalls. And next is spatial and detail memory. So when we're thinking about spatial and detail memory. This is like, what did the room look like? How big was something? And finally, we're going to see a different behavioral reaction when he's discussing a memory of dialogue and when he spoke to a person. That may not be all the categories. Those are the big three that we can actually pinpoint and look for here pretty easily. Uh, Greg and Scott uh, left the silence there for him to keep talking, and it actually worked. You can see how easy this is. Greg and Scott just didn't say, okay, as soon as he became a little bit close to being finished, uh, he continued to speak. When he says, up 81, and that's where I was working, he continued to talk to fill in the silence, which is great. And we're looking at uh, both of you guys and your quarter zip fleece that had to be planned. I'm, I'm watching this video wondering <laughs> about the planning for that. But, uh, it, Scott, I'll pass it to you. Yeah, we, we, we didn't want to go in and match like we're twinsies. But it was important to have to at least have a look that that the, from the top part, you had this. But the bottom part, you had jeans that were a little bit old. And a little bit, and Greg had on his cowboy boots, and I had on sneakers. So, it was, so we didn't want to look like we were, you know, FBI agents coming in in suits and like, "Hey, tell me what's going on." He's he's been dealing yeah, with all that. Of course, so we want to kind of be kind of. So yeah, that's that's really good, Chase. I, I wanted but to bring like it up just so people would understand why that was important, and you look unified as if you're on on a team together. Yeah. Yep. There you go. Yep. Yeah. Yeah. We're okay. Well, we'll talk about that later. Uh, anyway. Um, Where's my? Oh yeah. So as and again, talking about the interrogation part of it. Listen to Greg's tone of voice. It's real soft. As he, it, and it's and it's odd for for us to see Greg being all calm and soft about something for a lot of people anyway, not me. And to to be so kind as he's saying all these things, when, especially when somebody in, in that situation. So pay attention to to our approach to these. The way we're talking, you'll see our tone our to tones of voice voices. How you say it, grammatically correct change as we go throughout this and our body language will change as well right now we're being very still we're getting things really really quiet the lighting guys did a great job in there because they made it almost feel like a room in there of, of darkness around this light thing the the stuff we're looking at now will have to be brightened up a little bit because the 
this edit of it is too dark. But we're we're trying to, we're we're taking advantage of that. It was really quiet in there. It was a really big room, but it was really small right there. So it gave us that that intimate um, feel with him. And we were just close enough to reach out and touch him. That's what you want you want to be close enough to do that. Whereas we had that happened a couple of times in um, in emotional parts of the of the interview. So our approach to it, I'll talk about that on this end of it. Um, was at this point to be really calm and and understanding with him as we're trying to find out this information not only because we're trying to get him in a certain mood we want to see how he how he reacts to those questions in that mode as well in that mode that we're in as well so that's that was really important uh greg what do you got yeah so one thing i'm talking softer here you'll notice because i'm trying to bring him down to a different place and i'm not trying to threaten everyone everyone thinks i'm this mean scream and yell guy and we always say if you're being interrogated that way you're really not no one's effective doing that you should not even realize you're being interrogated as a matter of fact the guys with us thought well i wish you'd gotten what you wanted when it was over and we said oh oh trust us we got what we wanted yeah we got everything. because it was just a conversation but what i was after here is the first minor probe. This is a probe. Where were you? You know he's been asked this question a dozen times, a thousand times. And as far as I know, TBI and those guys will have cleared his story and said where he's at. So I didn't push too hard to go and find that. But when he said Jonesboro, his eye contact was really high. His blink rate goes way down, if you notice this, because he's certain of what he's saying. And he then he makes intentional eye breaks occasionally. And he tells me about this 45 minutes. now. Here's something that tells me I've tapped into a part of his brain that knows I'm on a threat question. I hear him start to change his speech pattern. And he goes, and, uh, and, uh, and that's where I was. And to your point, Chase, he's trying to figure out what am I after? And he's trying to make sure he satisfies what I'm after. But that and, uh, and, uh, and, uh, in there proves to me I'd hit the right spot with him. And so we're in the right cadence, we're at the right speech pattern, we have the right amount of eye contact, the right amount of silence, and you'll see us use this again as we get deeper into the questioning. We, we intentionally, I told him, they're gonna be hard questions I'm going to ask you. And I'll tell you when I'm gonna ask you hard questions. And people say, well, you're telegraphing. Yeah, because it creates stress. And that's a wonderful thing to say, I'm about to ask you some hard questions. Well, what are you going to ask? And you can see it in people when you do it. But if you watch him, he's nodding to, to get agreement. And when he says, I'm up 81 all the way, you just should know that when a person changes this way, it means you're tapping into something that's creating stress for them. And it's clear in his case. Uh, Mark, what do you got? Yeah, so it is a stress question. It is, where, where were you the night of? So it's, it's, the, it's one of the first questions that's going to come in, which has some heat behind it. And you might look at it and you might go, wow, there's a bit of a pause there. And he, and, and he doesn't seem to remember the name of the place or, you know, why doesn't that immediately come? Well, the things the things in his life don't immediately come the numbers the things don't immediately come the space is there for him he knows that really well he doesn't access the names of things so well there's there's a neural type that that goes with that but i'm not going to diagnose but and by the way you know body language can often just be a rorschach test of you so i'm going to look at him and i'm going to most likely see me and you're going to look at him and you're most likely going to see you so what you've got to do is pick up on some of what i'm saying and go so is don more like mark or is he more like me because i'm also going to engage my critical thinking as well and go it feels like me i bet he's a bit like me and he can't kind of work out the name of things but what if that isn't true perhaps it's not true so you've got to use these critical thinking ideas of perhaps and maybe so here's one of those we see him take a big in breath on that and this is a critical question there and he's breathing changes there well i already know this is a critical question and so i'm already primed to go oh i want to check out his breathing see if that breathing changes does he do big breathing heavy breathing and on a first glance he does but then i go back and look at the baseline and he doesn't so so you gotta keep going back and looking at the baseline this is not 
you know, really far enough off his baseline that I would suggest that he wasn't exactly where he says he was at this point. I think any disruption in this, any deviance from the, from the baseline that we've got is about this is a pressure question. This is an institutionalized guy. He knows that when the big question come, you've got to be careful, whatever. Whether you did it or you didn't do it, you've got to be careful. That's what I got for you on that one. The incident with Summer happened when Summer disappeared. Where were you working that day? Um, see, I was at uh, I was in Jonesboro. Okay. Okay. Yeah. Jonesboro, which? Yeah, Jonesboro. Um, uh, Tennessee. Yeah. Okay, because I, I, yeah. I don't know this area very well. Yeah. How Jones far away is that from home? Well, it takes forty-five minutes to get from there to my house. Okay. And uh, so up eighty-one all the way and. Uh, that's where I was working. Is, is there anything about Kansas' story that makes you question the story? No, not the way it played out and everything like that. I mean, yeah, you always have questions, and I ask myself, and uh, but the way that it happened and her emotions and her state of mind. What did you? What were the questions that you had? I mean, I not. I don't really have any. I mean, I question. Not, I don't really have any questions. I mean. Greg, what do you got? Yeah, so this is a really good example. I had a question, I asked the thought, I heard him stammer, stutter, I had a follow up, and I actually stepped on Scott because Scott was trying to get more information out of him here. If I'd been a little quieter, we would have gotten a little more information. But I think he was candidly, I think he's out of information, was just stammering to stammer. This made me wonder did he truly believe the story he'd been told? Because what he's telling us is a story that's secondhand. And when he tells us a secondhand story, it's rote memory. It's exactly what you expect from a secondhand story. You'll see him push his tongue out of his lips. Now his lips are bright ruby red, and we think it's probably because he smokes a fair amount and that kind of thing. But he does lick his lips a lot on when he gets under the stressful situation. M means something, maybe, but it is in his baseline. As he's going along, though, you, he cannot finish an entire thought. Now, he is not the most eloquent speaker, and Don would tell you that himself. I'm not beating him up for the way he speaks because we all have our own patterns. I have my own very southern speech pattern. But he stops and stammers and um, uh, um, uh, um, uh, 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 uh. I'm sure, number one, he's got to realize that Candace is going to watch this. Number two, how does it t work their stories? So this is a stress moment. We're seeing something in him that causes both Scott and I to want to go, hmm, why can't he answer that question with a simple no? If you asked me if my wife did something, I would have said no. Very simply, this is not a no. This is something much different. Scott, what do you got? Yeah, that was the point we were both, I was waiting for, for Greg to jump up his hind end, and he was waiting for me to jump up his hind end, and, but we knew better than, than that at that point, because yeah. all he's got to do is get up and leave if we, if we leaned into him really hard at that point. And as it, Loping stops here, Loping's where you're telling a story, almost like a, a, something loping through a field, like a horse running through a field, that kind of thing. And we're not seeing that here. He's editing as he goes along. He's self-editing in real time. Should I say this? What am I going to say? Then when he decides he didn't have any questions, when I said, well, what kind of questions did you have? And he didn't. And again, notice my tone of voice when we're saying that because we know this is important. We can't say, well, what kind of questions did you have? So we had to say, what kind of questions did you have? Almost almost like eh, throwing it out there. And his, and when he's answering as he self-edits, he's, he's thinking – I've got to be cool about this because you're right, Greg, he's got to go home to his life and his wife and live there. And she's going to be like, what, you don't believe me? What the hell are you talking about? You don't believe me. So he's got to deal with that. Knowing that as well, it was, it was the reason for our soft approach. But it's really important in there because that's when we bought, you're right, Greg, that's when we both said, you know what? I'm not so sure he believes what she's saying. And th this, we expand on that at another point, but it, this is really important part of it because this is not in his baseline. This is completely out of his baseline. He's really quiet. His eyes, his blink rate goes low. He's looking, he is licking his lips, but I don't think that's pushing out, you know, sour taste and all that. I don't think that's that at all. I think it's from, I think it's a, it's like a tick, like a nervous habit he has. But that's why his, his lips are so slick from smoking and doing that all the time. So, and licking his lips all the time. I think that's what that's from. So that we're not seeing any, I'm not going to say we're not seeing deception in there. Because it's I've seen a bunch of red flags, and there are like four of them in a row right there where he starts slowing down and, and he's editing. But that really was a point where I go, hmm, 
I'm not so sure he believes what he's saying. And as he's editing himself, I think he knows what he's going to say, but he's chopping it up and pushing things back in the rows to make sure everything's straight so he's good to go. Mark, what do you got? Yeah, so here's what I think he does know. He says um, he doesn't have questions about how it played out, the physical time of the narrative, all the stuff that he's good at. He doesn't have any questions around how that story played out, the time span, the, 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 the space. I don't think he's got a problem with that. He's got no questions around that. Um, the emotions and the state of mind. Now, again, he's talked about emotions in his baseline and he's pretty good at going, you know, uh, proud and, and naming emotions and, and, and happy. And so, so, and those are pretty basic, but that's a good baseline to say, if he thinks he knows that somebody is emotionally in a state, he's, he's already said that he's pretty good at that. He's proved that he's pretty good at that. So he's got no problem with that. He says, you always have questions. So we could look, we could bias towards the idea of, yeah, maybe he does wonder is Candace's story correct? Or maybe it's just the idea of, well, until you know something for sure, you always have questions. So there's the idea of mystery always exists, regardless until mystery is solved. And um, and I've and he says, and I've asked myself doesn't really finish that. The question is, what have you asked yourself? Because if you ask it of yourself, is it that, well, I asked myself, could I have done more? Could I have been better? Could I have protected more? In this whole interview, you hear about how unprotected that place is. It's completely exposed with people coming up, swapping out dogs. You know, just, I'll take your dog, I'll leave some other dogs there. They come up on horses, all kinds of other stuff to do stuff and stuff and things. And so it's a bit of an odd situation up there. And maybe you would ask yourself, is this really somewhere that have I really provided the right place? Have, has, has my wife, my partner provided the right place? So it could, it could be that I question any, any eye blocks on that. Chase, what are your thoughts on this? You guys got all the good stuff here. But uh, this video really shows us the power of baseline and how important baseline is. We know Don Wells likes to start questions as soon as he is able to get the gist of what you're asking him. This question was concise, crystal clear, and easily understood. And this amount of hesitation here would be a significant red flag for me in any interview. And I think Don starts to roll down a hill that Scott kind of put him on here and making him start to speak specifically about what he doesn't believe about the story. Because Scott just Scott kind of left a little incomplete question or just a, just kind of tossed that up. Well, what what is it? What is it you, you question? And just kind of started this ball rolling. And there's an increased blink rate when he's saying when he's denying that he fully believes Candace's story or he doesn't have any questions about it. And there's a single shoulder shrug, which indicates a lack of confidence in what a person is saying right at the end here. And if we scored this on the behavioral table of elements for deception, the score would be a 16 with a score of 11 indicating a likelihood of deception to be high. Is there anything about Candace's story that makes you question the story? No, not the way it played out and everything like that. I mean, yeah, you always have questions and I'd ask myself and, uh, but the way that it happened and her emotions and her state of mind. What did you, what were the questions that you had? I mean, I, I, not, I don't really have any, I mean, I question. No, I don't really have any questions. I mean, you, you've got some past. You said recently you've had some drug and alcohol things. Maybe have you? Who who in your life would you think is less than than above board that you deal with? Who in life has been above board? Yeah, who, who's less than above board? If I was saying, oh, I no, not, not nobody that I know of except for our neighbors and stuff. You know, I mean, the guy, the the, the meth heads and stuff like that and. Whatever, like that. I mean, we're trying to fly right, and we're trying to do the. No, I get right it, man. Right. Life is. Yeah, no. I would say life is a challenge between um, being this and what you, what is underneath. Okay, and let me let me back up for a minute with the stepsisters. They said they never knew we had a daughter. 
two and a half, three years ago, I called my dad and they were there. And they were bragging, you know, I was like, they was asking about summer, and I was like, yeah, yeah, you know, and uh, so they said they named one of theirs Winter. Mm. So they knew, they lied when they said they didn't know. All right, Greg, what do you got? Yeah, so in this case, we're asking him just some simple questions. Now I just lost my thought, sorry. Uh, <laughs> hit that again, I lost it entirely. Yeah. I had something else in my mind. Let me, let me edit that it's out. Too, Greg, what yeah, do you which, got? Yeah, 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 yeah. No, I, I may have to watch it again. Uh, which one was two? Oh yeah, who's above board? Here we go, there's some mm -hmm. comedy for you. So who's less than above board? You see him, he's like, what are you talking? Oh yeah, 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 I get it. And he, he does recognition and he says, and his eyes lock as he's saying this, we try to stay above board. Now I know, and he said, I've, you know, I've used drugs, I've done this, I've done that. So he knows some people that are less than above board by my standards, and he's probably interpreting what I'm saying. And so you see him making eye contact. And then he goes back to get out one of the stories that he came there to tell, because clearly Don had stories he wanted to tell. These are the ghost stories I was talking about. He's gonna tell you these stories. So he brings up the stepsisters. And you can see it, you can see a change in his code, in, in his cadence. He starts off when he's trying to figure out what I'm talking about, stammering and stuttering and a little slow, then makes good eye contact. Oh yeah, we try to stay above board and then goes back into a storytelling mode. That's what I saw. And I just kind of discounted the sisters thing as just something he needed to get out and that was that. Uh, Mark, what do you got? Yeah, I would agree completely. You, again, you've got to be careful you don't get stuck in his soap opera because this really is a piece of storytelling here. Uh, you, it's a classic. So you've got stepsisters. So that instantly tells you that they're going to be cast in, in the bad light. Uh, you're going to have a Cinderella character, the symbol of virtue unrecognized, which is the, you know, the dirty little waif and that summer. And you're going to have territorial aggression. So you've got, you know, fighting over, over the, the crown, which is, you know, the summer summer and winter battle that he that he talks about there. So there's some classics in there of a really good soap opera narrative of 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 family breakdowns and uh, territorial aggression. And so it could, you know, it, it looks a little bit like a sidestep into that narrative. But I think you're right, Greg, this is a story that he wants to to get out. Uh, he, he wants to play that narrative game, that YouTube game, as much as anybody else that he sees himself as battling against, that if they're going to make up a story, then I reckon I can tell a good story as well. And I would say it's a classic example because he draws down on a universal narrative instantly. If it were a, a truer story, there'd be more detail and it wouldn't fit so well that universal narrative so he just kind of draws down on the classic uh and just one last thing is he does a, that head that same kind of head turn away and locks eye contact with a challenge gesture there to greg on this same as he did with i think how do you get to your house so uh you know when he gets confused or maybe more likely is worried about the nature of the question and what is this question really about we see the aggression uh come out uh, here. Uh, and, and he wants to sidestep this idea of, of um, who he's connected with that don't fly right. Uh, so, so, you know, an interesting theme that, that carries on there. He wants to completely uh, take himself away from the names of the people that, um, that call by who don't fly right. There. Uh, Scott, what do you got on this one? All right. This is a really interesting one because as we're going through it, he's he's from the beginning of this, when we started talking to him, he suspects everybody. That's why he's bringing up all these parts about his stepsisters and people from YouTube and this and that. He suspects everybody. I mean, Greg, I don't know how many people I, I think I counted up to 12 at one point he was talking about and, and talked to him the other day and he was, he was sus suspected the guys who came and were, you know, didn't suspect him. But he said, hey, what about these guys that were cutting down the trees in my yard? Could that be the kind of I'm wondering if that would be. So he's got all these things that say he's concerned and really wondering who did this. That's one thing that, that stood out to, to us as, as we went through this. And. That, so that's the reason he's he's poking on those those stepsisters who said some bad stuff about him, whether it's true or not, I have no earthly idea. Um, but apparently it's been recanted what they said. So probably not true. Don't know. Um, Don't know that to be a fact. Yeah. But yeah. Oh, okay. Yeah, that's that's what he that's what he told me anyway. So um 
Yeah. So as, as he's going through this, it's really for me, it's really simple. He's he doesn't know exactly where we're going in this yet. I mean, he's got a pretty good idea. But when we start asking questions like this that he's not ready for, why would you ever ask something like that? And we, but he starts associating himself. He's using um, what what what's called you know, it's the same language addicts to you, addicts to use. You know, you hear Peter Hyatt talking about that. How people who are addicts will talk that way as well about we try to stay away from. You know, it wasn't I try to do this. It's like we as a group try to stay away from those kind of people. Um, that's where I'll stop there to keep it short. Chase, what do you got? Uh, one thing we're just talking about the we thing here. Don is uh, if we divide people into using three types of pronouns in their communication, there are people that use self pronouns, team pronouns, and then others in reference to other people. And Don uses a whole lot of team pronouns, even talking about the church, our Sunday school, we like to do this. We like to do this. So always speaking about he and Candace as our, us, we, which I think is a pretty good sign for how he feels about his connection to her uh, at the time that he was answering those questions. And right at the beginning of this clip here, you're going to see him close his eyes almost all the way for a minute to process this question and process the data. So he's really going through his mind. He is honest, I think, about trying to fly right. I think he's 100 percent honest. But what we don't know is his definition and his relationship to the words fly right, his relationship to the idea of what that means to him. There's this head nodding that we're seeing here is honest. There's comfortable cadence that he's loping here. He's on message. So this may, whether or not this is rehearsed does not make it deception. We can rehearse true things all day long. It's like our YouTube intros. They're truthful and very, very rehearsed. So and he's shaking his head exactly at the point that he's discussing the denial of someone else. So I think this is on message, is truthful, and in an interrogation scenario, and, and maybe in a regular conversation, this may come in handy. But if someone tries to do this big redirection, I'm going to treat this like when he's backing up to talk about his sisters, I will treat that as a denial, and I will stop it using the same process. I'll put my hand up and say, Don, I know that's very important to you, and I promise we're going to get to that in just a minute. We go right back to what we were talking about. The reason I think, I can't speak for him, Scott and Greg did this, is because this is not an interrogation. He's not captive, and he can walk out of that room at any time, and they're not there to uh, get a confession to a crime per se. They're there to collect data, and they're specifically there to collect a whole lot of data as much as possible that can be analyzed at a later date like we're doing right now. Yeah, I, I would have been impressed if we got a confession out of a guy in a Holiday Inn conference room. Yeah, yeah, we knew that, that going was? in, too. <laughs> yeah, yeah, that's all it was, guys. We knew yeah. there was little chance anybody was going to... Well, and, and we didn't know Don from Adam. I mean, we'd seen him on TV and that. Yeah. And, yeah. But it doesn't matter. The, the fact that most people are not going to confess, I think Dr. Phil said people don't confess in a crowd, the same mindset, right? That's the way you got to look at it. You, you've got some past. You said recently you've had some drug and alcohol things. Maybe have you? Who who in your life would you think is less than than above board that you deal with? Who in life has been above board? Yeah, who, who's less than above board? If I was saying, oh, I no, not, not nobody that I know of except for our neighbors and stuff. You know, I mean, the guy, the the, the meth heads and stuff like that and. Whatever, like that. I mean, we're trying to fly right, and we're trying to do the. No, I get it. Right. Man. Life is. Yeah, no. I would say life is a challenge between um, being this and what you, what is underneath. Okay, and let me let me back up for a minute with the stepsisters. They said they never knew we had a daughter. Two and a half, three years ago, I called my dad, and they were there, and they were bragging. You know, I was like, they was asking about summer, and I was like, yeah, yeah, you know, and uh, so they said they named one of theirs Winter. Hmm. So they knew, they lied when they said they didn't know. Yeah. I told you, I'm gonna have to ask you some hard questions. Yeah. yeah. So what do you say to somebody who says, no, you're involved, your family's involved? How, how do you respond to that? Well, for three months, I spent on the phone for three months. I, I accepted every friend request there was, people want. Hey, well, I'm your friend, I'm your friend, we can report you. And, you know, through, for three months, I stayed on the phone, day and night trying to find our baby because I figured you, Facebook's the best tool possible mm -hmm. to help find her. And uh, But there's this group on Facebook combating us the whole time, and we don't know who this group is or what they're up to. All right, Greg, what do you got? 
So this one bugged the hell out of me. I've watched this one a dozen times. I've poked on this one because it is the most anomalous thing he does through this entire, entire video. I was sitting across from him and thinking, what the hell is this guy talking about? He just shifted gears and went down the path of, I'm on YouTube, I'm doing this, I'm playing around on Facebook, not YouTube, I'm on Facebook, I'm answering every email, I took every friend request. But his body language doesn't look like he's nervous or lying. I was thinking this guy's either like some mastermind evil genius guy and he's been playing me the whole time or I'm missing something. And I watched this video a dozen times probably and just over all that time still couldn't get exactly to what it was. And Scott pinged it. Scott, you want to tell him what you saw? Yeah. So when that happened, Greg and I were both like, Oh, you can hear it. If you're in our brain, your ears go, oh, go, yeah. here it is. Go, go, no. We look like brain ventriloquist. Oh, my God, dude, here it comes. And so what happened was this. He, he didn't understand the question. He thought it was, how do you respond to those people who are saying that on Facebook, in social media? How do you, what do you do to respond to that? Not like if we were to say, so what do you think about when people say that we think you're full of it. What do you think about that? That's the way we're coming. That's the way we thought it was delivered, but it wasn't delivered. But he didn't take it that way. In, in, in other words, he thought we were saying, how do you respond to those people on Facebook and on YouTube? That's his answer. That's why he goes back to, I joined all these things. because I know that's the number one place to, to find out about uh, a missing child. I know. It. So he's telling us the things he did to help her. So his brain isn't even going down that road that he might be in trouble for something. Now, if you had been, if you'd been waiting for that question and you, or, or on guard, you would have taken that question for the way it was meant, but he didn't, he was, his, his head wasn't in that space because even if you were in there a little bit, you would have been on there and go, Hey man, here's what I, I say. But he was, but he took, how do you respond as how do you respond to those pe people on Facebook? That's why we're seeing it. And after that, man, just boom, just lopes the ride along, tells us everything. Not, not, not a whole lot there that's outside of his baseline at all. Uh, Mark, what do you got? Yeah, you, sh you guys should have called me because the moment I saw that, I understood because I understood understand the neural type. He missed the spirit of the question. The spirit of the question is: What do you say to? anybody on the planet nobody specific but like anybody who says you probably know what went on here his brain goes oh you're talking about somebody specifically and it goes i know specifically who you're talking about and it locates that specific person and the group they belong to and starts to recount the story of that and how he's done everything that he could and should do to appease that individual or, or unnamed, unspecified group. Uh, you know, the spirit of the question was, what do you say to the kind of person who doesn't believe you? He went, I know the person you're thinking of. Let me tell you everything that I've done to appease this group. So yeah, uh, you look, there, there are some neural types out there that will take you really quite literally. And, and he could be part of that group, or it could be the pressure of this moment, or simply that every question that comes is a Rorschach test. And you just go, well, here's something I want to get off my chest. You know, here's something I want to talk about. Here's what it means to me. And so I'm going to take your question and unconsciously make it the question that would mean that I could give you this answer. But look, you know, the important thing for me is, is look how far awry you would go if you took his answer as being, um, him being duplicitous or not telling the truth or which you could easily mistake it for if you wanted to, if you didn't take this line that we've taken, which is, well, you just, just didn't understand the spirit of the question here. Uh, Chase, you got anything different from that? Shock us if you, if you can. It sucks. You guys got everything, but I will <laughs> say, you know, on the just the analysis of the behavioral table of elements, if you just use that with no experience, you would have seen hesitancy, you would have seen ambiguity, and you would have seen a non-answer. That's not even hit. That's just his verbal. That's not his body. So you would have seen all those, which would have given you a score of 12. Not understanding that he interpreted that as how did you, what did you type back to these people? How did you respond to these people who were making these accusations on, on the internet? So I think it's fascinating. Increased blink rate at the very beginning is not deception at all. That's him processing like, oh, 
That, that's what got me. So when the blink rate went up and I know he's processing, he doesn't need to process. Well, like, here's what I would say to a person. He needs to process. Here's all the messages and human beings that I've spoken to. And I'm going to make some sort of amalgamated answer for that. And he continues to use team pronouns here. It's our, our group and they, and them all throughout the, the response here. So that's all I got. This is a fan, fascinating clip. You know, and the interesting thing for me is I actually said it two ways because I saw his face when I said, what do you say to? And he kind of had a look and I said, how do you respond? And that's just, that's when he seized on the question is what I see now. Mm -hmm. And you, when you're asking questions, you try to get through to a person with whatever you see. And I could tell he was a little confused by what I was asking in the very beginning. That was all. But yeah, it was a great catch, Scott. I told you, I have to ask you some hard questions. Yeah. Yeah. So what do you say to somebody who says, no, you're involved? your family's involved. How do you respond to that? Well, for three months, I spent on the phone for three months. I, I accepted every friend request there was, people want. And, well, I'm your friend, I'm your friend, we, we can report you. And, you know, through, for three months, I stayed on the phone, day and night, trying to find my baby, because I figured you, Facebook's the best tool possible mm -hmm. to help find her. And, uh, but there's this group on Facebook combating us the whole time, and we don't know who this group is or what they're up to. Let's let's do this. Uh, Chase, put those glasses back on a minute. Let's all decide who Chase looks like, because I know. I don't Everybody know. Everybody got it? Looks like that little mouse. <laughs> What's that little mouse that wears glasses like that? Oh, is um, it Stuart uh, Little? Stuart Little. Stuart yeah. <laughs> <That's what it's laughs> now, now there's going to be Pretty a good. swarm of, of art coming in from panelists. There will be. There will be. I can't <laughs> wait. Did you rape your sister? No. Did you rape your niece? No. Did you molest your first set of children? No. Did you threaten to kill them? I can, give you, I can give you my kids' number and we can talk when this is done. Sure, sure. And we'll did, talk to them. Sure. Did, did you threaten to kill them? No. I want to go last. Okay. Stuart, you want to go first? <laughs> We're seeing this eye closure, which guarantee you, if, if, uh, if we just aired this without our analysis, we'd see a thousand comments of like, oh, there's rapid blinking. He's lying. Uh, we're looking at clusters to determine deception. We're looking at multiple things to determine deception. And we've also determined that this blinking is part of his baseline. He's processing data on every single question here. Each denial is rapid. His answer is rapid. He tends to have a lot of latency, which is a time between the end of a question and the beginning, when there is hesitation and when there's doubt and when there's like, I need some time to make something up or I need some time to think through my answer. This eye closure is not enough to say that he's being deceptive. And the only movement here uh, of hesitation is the final denial that he makes. On the very final denial, the small retreating motion of the head and some eye closure there. And neither of these would score as deceptive. Even adding them together would only give you an eight. So... This is an, a, an excellent masterclass, mini micro masterclass in what we're talking about when we say clusters. It's like there's a, here's a deceptive behavior. Here's a deceptive behavior. It doesn't mean much. And one of those deceptive behaviors that you might see is something that this person does habitually all the time, no matter what they're talking about. So that's when we say baseline is important and probably secondary to baseline is looking at clusters. Scott, what do you got? All right, I'm going to I'm going to say those first three. This the last one so different than those first three questions. Did you threaten to kill him? No. Oh, all the classics. Backs up, says as he says no, it goes quieter. Ah, goes it goes ah, but you see hear that go up there in the middle. Man, that's when I want to but there's no reason to lay into that because it doesn't lay it doesn't go with what we're, we're dealing with at that point. So I laid off it. But that's the one that made me get bigger. I wanted to go, yes, you did. You know, you did. I want to do one of those. <laughs> but I, I didn't at that point. But I, I would have had every right to uh, looking back on it. So um, the, the I think I agree with Chase 100%. Mark, what do you got? Yeah, yeah, I, w I would agree. Um, so clear, confident denial in the in the 
in the first lot of them. And in, within that first lot, he even confronts, becomes aggressive, I would say, uh, with with uh, Greg there, like we've seen him get at other times. And then he substantiates his claim. Not a great substantiation, like, you know, we can go and ask these people, if you like. That's not a huge substantiation, but he does substantiate at that point. He's clearly going to go, look, let's, it's not just me that's going to say this, it's other people as well. Ask the community kind of thing. So so that's that's important, but I would agree. We get swallow gesture on the last one. We get slight, slight sour taste there. We get slight head turn on that as well. Yeah, if I were to lay money, has, has he th threatened in some way to kill somebody in some way at some point? Pr yeah, probably. Probably, but is it important for this situation here? I, I don't think so. But I think he knows. Yeah, he's 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 had a he's had a number, or he's you know, or he's got angry, and he's said some stuff. And and I think you know many of us might fall into that position at some point as well. And if asked that question, uh, you know, and, and wanting to say no, we might show some of the same indicators as well. Greg, what are your thoughts on this one? Yeah, so this is a really good one for me. We always say that people can have more than one way of dealing with folks in, in a situation. What I think we're seeing here is Don dealing with authority, where he perceives us to be authority or whatever it is, and he is very kind and polite and quiet. I guarantee you, and this is not just Don, this is everybody, there's another side we are not seeing here. That swallow before he gets to that question, these are nasty questions. And if you think he's responding by his blink rate or that coming, any one of you, just show up and let me poke you and ask you, did you do this? Did you do that? Did you? We tell you all the time that people get angry when they're accused of something they didn't do. And we can see a little bit of that and that rise in his respiration, a little bit of that. Just pay attention to him and you'll see just a little edge rise in Don at this point. I could see it there. And then I agree with you, Scott, and with you, well, with the three of you, when he gets to that fourth question and he goes, no, something sounds odd and off. And I agree with you, Mark. Did you threaten to kill him? It could mean I'm going to kill you if you keep that up. It could mean, no, I'm going to come out there and kill you. We know that he can rant and rave. You can find him on YouTube and doing that kind of thing. But every person can when pushed to a point. I'm not defending him, but saying I can see the other person behind there. And Don's not a little fella. He's a good sized fella. Mm -hmm. So he's probably been accustomed and he works with his hands. He's probably been accustomed to being physical in his life, and he had to make it through. As he told us in the very beginning of the story, I was raised in county jails. So he had to be relatively tough in his life, and I would bet with the right amount of pushing, I could get a little bit more aggression out of him. And I could sense that sitting across from him and asking these very ugly questions. And I agree with you. He went and said, we'll call my kids. He didn't say, we'll call my other accusers because they're accusing. They're also accusing him of doing something to his kids. But he said, my kids will tell you that didn't happen. And so there, I'll leave it at that. Did you rape your sister? No. Did you rape your niece? No. Did you molest your first set of children? No. Did you threaten to kill him? I can give you. I can give you my kids' this number, and we can talk when this is done. Sure, sure. And we'll did, talk to him. Sure. Did Did you threaten to kill him? No. Okay. All right, here we go. Do you know where Summer is? Oh well, no. I wish you I have did. Any earthly idea what happened to her? No. I wish I did. Do you think Candace had anything to do with it? No. And what about this? You, and you think what might have happened to her was what? She was kidnapped. Yeah. All right, Mark, what do you got? Yeah, very simple. Um, she was kidnapped. Seems very assured of that. Downward intonation on that. Um, the, the eye contact that he has on that. Really, really assured. So I'm just going to leave it at that. I've got a question about it. Um, any earthly idea what happened to him, uh, to her? And then we get this eye flutter on that. And I don't know what that might be about. So I'm kind of interested what, you, you know, ideas on that. Uh, Chase, uh, what do you think? Any any answer for me on that eye flutter just after? Any earthly idea what happened? No, I think he's processing data. I think an eye flutter wouldn't mean very much. Um, did you want me to go as well? Yeah, 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 right. yeah, I'm done. I mean, that's just assured for me. That's the only question I have in that one. Yeah. Okay, so the, <laughs> his eye closure here, if we're just gonna stick on that, is different in the question about Candace. 
and every other question throughout the entire video, even the, the clips that we're not looking at here with you, his, his eyes flutter. When I'm talking about Candace, they shut. They are shut down. And each of his denials are contain multi-syllables. There are high frequency tones, there's low frequency tones, so there's tonal fluctuation in his voice. And when it comes time to talk about Candace, Scott asked him about Candace, and Scott gives you gave him time to talk. You didn't you didn't just let him say one thing. There's plenty, there's a huge window of time for him to talk. So there's no frequency, no highs and lows, one syllable, one word answer, and it's a downward tone which is the opposite of him talking about being kidnapped. And this stands out as being so different uh, that this is a huge red flag. His eyebrows move and communicate in every single denial, except for the one about Candace. His head shake slowed down and was more deliberate when it came down to talking or denying uh, speak, when he's speaking about Candace. And his no turned into a nah more when he was making that denial about Candace and he nods his head yes while saying that she was kidnapped, which goes with his baseline behavior is in that he believes it and that he agrees with that statement. So I will say the there is, uh, I'll just say, I would suggest that there is a very high likelihood for deception around the question that Scott, you specifically asked uh, about Candace. And I'll let you talk about that. All right. Um, my concern with 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 this at at first was when I said, "Do you know what happened to her?" And he said, "No, I wish I did." Now, a lot of times you'll hear parents say, "I wish I did." After that, no, I wish I did. That's that's fairly common if you go through through the, these people that are that are asked that question. But when we got to the end, I said, well, "What is it you think that happened to her?" And I was saying these things not like, "So, what do you think happened to her?" It was their very wide as I'm asking him. So he has to take him in word at a time and almost guess what I'm going to say next. So we can get that reaction once it dawns on him. That's the part that bothered me when he said she was kidnapped. Greg has a great take on, on that specifically. Um, but we find, I, I think later on we're getting, we get into a situation where as he goes through, we, we still aren't confident that he believes Candace. I, and for my, my, perception of what's going on I'm not so sure he believes what she's saying because what what chase what you're saying you've covered everything on that so yeah the eye and her eye blinks have and her eye blocking at that point has a plays a huge part in that huge part in that um greg what do you got yeah there's a difference in and in, in chase you're on to exactly what i was hearing everything else there's the no no oh Oh, just if you just listen, it's a grunt almost when he comes out about Candace. And I had the same suspicions. And the last one, I'm going to leave everything else off and just talk about the last one. Kidnapped is the first time we hear this word. He's used the word abducted before. Kidnapped is not the same as abducted. Kidnapped usually comes along with a request for something in exchange for the person. Most all humans think that. We watch TV. We know. Now, could it be that it's a subtlety wasted on Don? Could be. But when I heard that word, my brain went ding, 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 because, you know, I'm a hammer and nails are there. And I worked, you know, anti-terror through my life. Kidnapping means something. There's a reason. It's political. It's economic. He has nothing political to offer. So what are what in his head does he think kidnapping means? And then along with that Candace thing, it, it, it just raised all of my red flags. Now, does that mean that he intentionally did that? Don't know. Does it, did he say kidnapping versus abduction? He said in other places. Don't know. Does he know the difference? Don't know. We didn't get to that level of nuance. The last thing I'll leave you with is when you're talking about someone you have a very tightly bonded relationship with and they've been together for a long time, your tone may be different when you're talking about them. If I ask Scott about Amber, his tone will be different than if I ask him about Chase. For example, because you're I don't know about that. I, I, you never yeah. know. I don't know about your guys' relationship you outside very, of work. We're very close. <laughs> Chase and I are very close. Do you know where Summer is? Oh no, I wish. Do you I have did. any earthly idea what happened to her? No, I wish I did. Do you think Candace had anything to do with it? No. And what about this? You, and you think what might have happened to her was what? She was getting out. Yeah. Right. Great. All right, now awesome. let's run around the room really quickly 
and we'll all give uh, you know 30 seconds or less of what we think happened. We'll go to Mark, we'll go to Sweetie Pie, then we'll go to, to Greg, and we'll see what or where we end up there. Mark? Yeah. So, uh, you know, what comes out of this for me is how easily he wa gets wound up in this soap opera that's that's going on uh, concurrently with the search for Summer Wells. And I think it's quite easy for us to get wound up in that soap opera. What I take away from this is to try not and to do that and try and stick to the, the more factual elements that we can see around us. Uh, so really, you know, this whole thing is just a lesson for me in saying, can we can we keep things a little bit narrower and not widen it out into this extraordinary soap opera with with stepsisters and all kinds of and, and YouTubers and Facebook and all these people involved and narrow it a little more down, because I think that's where we're going to find the real issues here. When I look through the whole of the interview, I do get interested by how um, unsecure that area is and all the people who come up with, for, for all kinds of reasons, uh, looking for her. Um, that's where my nose would be going right, right now towards that. Not so much on Don. It could be wrong. Chase. Your thoughts. This video really illustrates the importance of understanding microcultures and cultural differences in people. This is the reason that we baseline human beings. And when we hear these phrases like got gone, and things like that, I didn't know until very recently that that's common along the entire part of the country. It's a super common phrase. My mistake. I'm open, open to admit all that stuff because that's that's part of what we're understanding when we're talking to somebody that's in a microculture. We're also talking to a person with a checkered past that everyone will use to paint the future. I'm going to dip my finger in this past. I'm going to start to just paint the future. And I'm going to be very certain about what's going on. I think that, in my opinion, that Don Wells is mostly honest, and I think that there is a tremendous amount of doubt or uncertainty that at, at a minimum with Candace's story or her level of involvement or her knowledge of, of what actually took place. And maybe there's some, some knowledge there. I think I went over 30 seconds. I apologize. Greg, what do you got? Yeah, this is one of those great opportunities for you to take away your bias. I, I'm going to tell you, when I went there, the guy has a background. We know he has a background. He may even still be doing some things that you are, may or may not agree with. I'm not talking to any of that. I went there with one purpose in mind. I wanted to know what he knew about Summer Wells, what this whole thing is about, and whether he was involved in the disappearance of Summer Wells. I'll tell you based on his baseline, which we went through a lot of process to discover, pushing him into corner with some simple questions that he had no reason to lie about that caused stress and looking for that stress level to rise. And then finally going right to the point and hammering and seeing him emotional about this kid the day before, I'm going to tell you, I don't believe he's involved in her disappearance. Could I be wrong? Sure. But based on everything I saw face to face, based on everything I felt and saw and learned and thought and listened by watching and listening to his baseline and looking for deviation at the key moments, I don't think he's involved. Scott, what do you got? I agree with you, Greg. I don't think he is either. H having been there with him, I agree 100% with you. I don't think he was involved at all. He, he didn't answer the questions correctly to be involved as far as that goes. But I agree with you guys. This is a perfect example of, it's, it's a great example of being able to not only uh, watch somebody be questioned and, and interviewed, but be able to, to get the other side of the people who are interviewing it, give you their side of it as well. Why we ask questions this way, why our approach was a certain way, why we were quiet here, why we get a little bit louder in other parts, which I think we're going to do. Are we going to do a, part, a next part two of this, you guys? I'm, I'm for it. Sure. We should keep bringing it up until we find summer. Sure. Okay. Yeah, because they're going to find out what happened. And I, I, and I agree with Greg. I don't think he had anything to do with it. So at the same time, I don't think I don't think he believes Candace or, or, or her story on that, whatever it is, you know, I guess from the TV interviews. So I think it's a great example to be able to see someone be interviewed and also get the, the um, 
the input from people who interviewed that person and why they did it and give you an insight as to what we're thinking is to get those uh, questions asked and to, to elicit those answers from them. All right. Well, if you like what we're doing, please subscribe. All you got to do is hit that little red thing down there and then hit the bell so it lets you know when we have a new one come out. I just and, want to say a quick thanks to Dr. Phil and the entire Paramount uh, team here. I'm in L.A., I'm staying in a really nice hotel with really crappy Wi-Fi. I texted <laughs> Dr. Phil last night and he had all of this stuff set up. The producers are in here and let me kind of just borrow just, his little filming area. So I do want to give a, a, a shout out to Dr. Phil and the, and the entire team here uh, for letting me come crash the studio. Yeah, nice. Hey, and, can I add one thing? Guys, everybody listening, you. Summer Wells, post that photo, get her picture. I mean, we know it's in a lot of places. Get her picture everywhere. This is a little kid, and she's missing still. Do what you can to find her. Yeah. Also, Greg and I got our flu shots just to chase his right over there a couple of days ago. <laughs> <laughs> we were there, and Dr. Phil goes, you, you fellas want a flu shot? Because he was getting one. We're like, yeah, we'll do flu shots. So we got our flu shots there as well. Scott, He's Scott a doctor. Cried, so. He's cried. a doctor. <laughs> no, that's right. He is a doctor. So Scott you know, cried. <laughs> So it doesn't matter what happened. <laughs> My reaction to it. <laughs> it's not true. Anyway. All right. Well, thank you so much for being with us. And this is a good one, fellas. We'll see you next time. See ya. Yeah, I don't know why I guess I don't know.